In Europe and in the United States, there has been a great deal of talk about increasing income inequality, even in the face of our economic recovery from the financial crash, a trend which was well underway before the crash. In your country, China, there has been a great deal of concern about whether you've achieved the biggest movement of people out of extreme poverty into the global middle class in history, but done it in a way that overheated the economy, leading to the current difficulties, one in which you deal with every day because of the nature of the work you do. Between countries, there is still growing inequality, notwithstanding the fact that dramatic progress has been made with the effort to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, which just expired, in reducing extreme poverty. And basically, what we're finding is we have done, as a world, quite a remarkable job in creating a structure of opportunities for people to move from being just under the poverty line to getting over it, but the people who are more isolated in deep poverty have had a greater difficulty escaping it for geographic and other reasons. The political debate has taken a turn in most countries rather different from the partnership and networking approach we take pushing people further apart when most of us believe this can only be made better by working closer together. So first, I'd like to ask you, given the, the incredible advances in technology in the last few years and the likelihood of the pace only accelerating, as well as the advancements in biology, physics, and other areas. Is it realistic to expect more shared prosperity any time in the future? And if so, how should we define equality? Elizabeth, for example, she can talk about this, but she, she has become wildly popular among those of us who follow things like this for developing a comprehensive blood test that will tell you all kinds of stuff for prices that are more than 50% below the normal re Medicare reimbursement rate. Th that, um, and demanding the democratization of access to those results to the people who give the blood. You know, there, that's another way of defining increasing equality both in terms of what information you get and how much less cash you have to pay out. So, and we all know that Jack started off providing goods at a breathtaking pace and is now looking into all kinds of other things. So I'd like to give both of you a chance just to talk about this. A, is it realistic to think that we can continue to reduce inequality across the world and within advanced economies, given the rate of technological advance? And B, do we need to be more creative and realistic about how we define what reducing inequality means and increasing opportunity? Want to go first? I think absolutely. I think the promise of technology is that we can make access to basic infrastructure and, in many cases, to more advanced infrastructure than is even currently available today in developed economies, available to people who are the most in need in the same way that cell phones have leapfrogged over the lack of landlines in so many places. And I think the, the promise of Silicon Valley and these places in the world in which there's so much creativity is that we can uh, demonstrate that there are models for doing well by doing good and for applying technology 
um, and developing technology for those who are who are most in need. I mean, the the best business models now are ones where you're developing goods and services for prices that are lower than those that are subsidized by foundations. And when you bring that type of basic access, in our case, we're focused on health and access to health information, it's the first step in being able to get people well enough to go to school and to be able to pursue economic development. Well, first, I, I want to make a point and then give both of you a chance to follow up on that, but I want Jack to answer the question. Buried in that very eloquent statement is an assumption that the market can be made to work for social good given the right incentives, mm -hmm. and that it is a, if, if you believe, as I do, that every place we work with my foundation, not the CGI, my goal is to work ourselves out of a job. Mm -hmm. I believe people want to stand on their own two feet. I think they want to be empowered. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's one of the reasons I've been so impressed by your dogged determination not only to cut the cost and increase the quality of lab tests, but to give people who give the blood the results of their test. Yeah, Quick. absolutely. So, Jack. Yeah, um, I think today people worry a lot about the world, about the economy, China, economy in the world. And, but I'm a very optimistic. When people start to worry, that, that is the opportunity is. Right? I worry about the blood testing and she created uh, good things. And I think great innovations, great companies always happen in the tough times. The lives like uh, the music, you have uh, up, you have a down, you have a long, you have a short notes. And I, I like the American movie, life, life is like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're gonna get, <laughs> right? So I'm pretty optimistic. The opportunity in the future for equality is huge. Because in the, in, in the last century, the IT is for big companies. The globalization is for big companies. But now with the technology, we can serve those 80% of the companies that have never been served. We can serve the 80% of the young people that have never been served. Technology for internet is so cheap, so easy to use. One of the reasons why we grow in China e-commerce so fast, much faster than the USA, because our infrastructure of commerce in China was too bad. When it is too bad, something happened and goes. Today, we are working on the rural areas of China. I can never imagine that China, about 800 million people still live in the rural areas, are farmers. And there are about close to 200 million people. Their income is less than $1 per day. And before the internet, it's impossible for these guys to reach the PC because it's so difficult. Even people like me, I don't know how to use a PC. But now 80% of the farmers, those people using mobile phones. When have the mobile phones, the internet, the data, things change a lot. So I'm excited about the future. People always worry, that's the, you know, I, I love the young kids sitting there and talking about the dream, the hopes, because if they have the hope, we have the hope. That's what I believe. And Let's just take what you do. And I've loved every description I've ever heard about how you serve people and your story about the bamboo farmers and your wife and her friends. It was fabulous. But where's this going? What are you going to do? What are your plans to maximize the use that people in remote rural areas of China can make of their cell phones besides ordering your projects. How are you going to get it? Are you going to get them in the banking system through cell phones? How? Well, um, we, we never know that we can grow so fast. In the past five months, we covered 4,500 villages. And these people, normally, they, they use in very traditional way they t it took them like two, uh, we went to a rural area, it took them, the farmers two hours to work to the downtown uh, in, in the middle of the town and buy things. But today, because the mobile phone, and we, we can deliver things to their home, to their village within 72 hours. I remember there is a, well last week I read a very interesting thing, this is amazing. There is a girl, she told me a story. 
She said her grandfather, 92 years old, birthday. And for his life, he always wanted to try one Western style food. But he lived in the rural areas. There's no such restaurant food. So she said, I tried on the internet, book a, a restaurant dinner for Western food, deliver to that village. And they finally immediately find the one restaurant. There are three guys. They took like a three days bus from, the, from Shanghai to that village, <laughs> made an Italian spaghetti and a beef for them for this 92 years old birthday. And the whole village was excited. Everybody said, wow, you can order food, rest, you know, rest, rest of style food. So buying almost everything. And also we're helping, there are a lot of uh, fa farmers, they plant a lot of apples, great apples. But 90% of the apples rotted because there's nobody buy them. They normally buy by track. You know, if you sell the, uh, the, the apples, they sell whole track. And using the traditional way, they can, they can sell by whole basket of the uh, apples. But now, because of the internet, they sell by one by one. Each apple, they sell $1. Oh, you know, one IMB or two IMB for each. So the farmers will see using internet, they can buy and sell using the mobile phone. That changed their lives. And I think it's exciting. And people need examples when they see, well, the other, my neighbor make, made money through online to selling things. My neighbor made, you know, buy much interesting things online. People start to learn. And more, more people start to buy the mobile phones. We cannot, ha we cannot make all the factory, the mobile factories to sell phones to them. Only they know the mobile phone really works, help and change their lives, they start to buy the mobile phones. Just one more question, and then, do you think this will make the current problems like the current problem in China less likely? That is, if we'll have more market information in the market, we'll drive where the investment goes, instead of the government trying to make judgments about, I better build another housing development or office development here, there, or yonder, and you wind up with a bubble. Well, if it comes from the bottom up, is it more likely that fewer th bad things will happen? Yeah, you know, I think the, uh, last week I was in Seattle discussing about the China economy. I think the, you American people worry too much about the China economy. <laughs> well, you see, every time wait, when wait, you wait. start to worry about the China, China goes better. Every time you think China's in problem, you know, we'll, go, you know, we'll get better. But when you have a say, ah, we have a, you have a high expectation of China, China always a problem. <laughs> like uh, parents have the expectation of the kids, you know, are the same. But there's a big difference between American consumption because people say, well, you know, the economy is bad, so China consumption will be good low. No, totally different. You Americans love to spend tomorrow's money. And the other people's money, maybe. <laughs> or maybe the children's money. We Chinese love to save money. We are probably the largest country, uh, the, the de safe deposit in the whole world that we people, because we've been poor for so many years. When we made money, we put it in the banks, because someday we know the disaster is coming, so we can spend the money. So when the economy is bad, we still have the money to spend. You guys probably don't, you worry. And the second thing is that China being market, China been focusing on developing for the past 30 years. China government so strong on investment, so strong on exporting, but they are too weak on the domestic consumptions. Domestic consumption is not driven by government; it's driven by entrepreneurship, driven by the market, not the government. So in the past two years, past 20 years, government is so strong. Now they get a week. It's our opportunity. It's our show time to see the market economy, entrepreneurship, how we can develop the real consumption. You know, I think if the China develop the great consumption, we have a 300 million middle class. In next 15 to 20 years, we're going to have a billion middle class. We need to import a lot. So when we start to import, that's a great, it's going to, I worry a lot when we export. You know, when we export, we got a terrible sky, we have a terrible water, we have a terrible environment. When we start to import, we got to be better. 
So that's all the great opportunity, guys. Be happy about that. <laughs> I'm serious. I agree with that. I'm serious. Yeah. I'm. Um, we uh, you, worry about yourself. Don't worry the about reason, the others. The reason some of us worry about China is we depend on you to buy our debt. <laughs> However, I tried to be more Chinese when I was president. I saved a lot of money, so. <laughs> Good. You know. Good. But uh, I just wanted you to say that because I really believe that. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The, the trend toward greater internal consumption is, I think, will remain unbroken in spite of whatever the difficulties are in the next few months. I think it's important not to overreact. You can't break the trend. You've got to clean up the land from chemical contaminants. You've got to clean up the air. You're going to do it. Yep. And a lot of Chinese will make a lot of money out of that. There'll be a lot of great new companies, and there'll be opportunities to import from other places. Yeah. So can you discuss your theory of what you're doing and other things in terms of whether it advances equal opportunity and social solidarity? Tell them what you think is going to happen. And what other kinds of, when your opening remarks you just said, uh, technology is going to be active in this way in other areas of the economy. What do you think the next big opportunities are? But first, hey, tell them just in two sentences what you're doing, because Jack and I know, and we haven't been clear enough. Explain it, and explain how you think that advances social solidarity and equality of opportunity. Our work is in uh, the belief that access to health information is a basic human right. And that lab information particularly, because lab data drives 70% of clinical decisions, um, needs to be accessible to people before they're sick. So if you look at the word diagnose in the dictionary today, it says to determine the presence of disease from symptoms, which means by definition, we're determining that people are sick once a disease has already progressed. And our work is in being able to make lab testing accessible to people in time for therapy to be affected, and to do that in a way in which every person, irrespective of their insurance status, irrespective of where they live, can afford the ability to get a test done. So that means, in our case, we've invested the last 12 years in now developing hundreds of tests, many of which are uh, less than $10. So you know, $2 tests in the United States. And I think one of the amazing things about this country is that we have such an incredible um, ecosystem for fueling creativity, and that creativity can create new markets. So in answer to your question about the market being able to conform itself to social good, I think the creativity that goes into creating new, new technologies creates new markets in and of themselves. And, and our basic belief that is that those new markets come from empowering individuals and enfranchising individuals and trusting that individuals have the capability to engage with information. And in accessing that information, beginning to take control of their own outcomes and their own health outcomes, and in doing so, changing the way our healthcare system works. Think what this could mean for rural China, yeah. for rural India, for Native American reservations yeah. in America, for the Mississippi Delta, for the remote areas of where all the jobs were lost from cold. You're all of a sudden giving people information and uh, one of the most important things I think we did in my second term as president in the healthcare front was develop this diabetes self-care program. And all of a sudden, you could be, Jack's company could be delivering the means to self-care based on your test. I mean, I think that this is really, this is a very big deal. We all want to live as long and as well as we can. And Craig Venner was here. We were joking about whether we'd make it to 100. But in the meanwhile, you want to keep people healthy. And if they're sick, you want to intervene early, not late. Yeah. Well, and, and if you look at, I mean, the ability to engage with this information, we have a $4 trillion healthcare problem in this country. 
20% of it is type 2 diabetes, which is reversible. And we have 90 million Americans who do not know they are pre-diabetic. But access to information and the ability to engage with that information is the foundation for being able to change those outcomes and, and cost, right? One more fact, and then I want to call on Jack. You founded this company 12 years ago, right? Yeah. Tell them how old you were. I was 19. <laughs> so, don't worry about the future. We're in good hands. So, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about 19, what I, where I am. You know? 19, I've not uh, passed the examination for university yet. <laughs> I failed three times, but. I think it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at schooling. Well, yeah, that's why I give confidence to a lot of young people in China. If Jack Ma can, success, can be successful, 80% of the people can be successful. <laughs> people like her, you know, we're jealous. Yeah. Well, equality, I, I would like to make a little bit of technology helping because yesterday I was joining the United Nations, UN uh, Women Conference about gender equality. And I think the first technology revolution happened 200 years ago in the UK, released the human body, the arm, stronger. The second technology revolution in the, U, in the, in the US, if our energy, you can last long. But this technology of revolution relief, release the brain. So this century is not a competition who is stronger, whose muscle is stronger. It's who is smarter, who is soft, who can listen. You, it's the a challenge of wisdom. So men and women are equal. On the internet, you can never see he's a woman or a man. And on the internet, women can serve much better than, than men on the internet. And a man talking about a business, talking about you know, numbers, competition, they make business very cold. Women, they make business very cozy, lifestyle, and interesting. 50%, more than 50% of our shop owners, more than half, five million shop owners are women. And people love that. I mean, this is, this is a great thing I see that this century we see more and more women leaders, right, on the state leaders, and the presidents. And in, the, in the future, we're going to general secretary of the United Nations should be a women leader. And this is the great century for equality. And I, I feel excited about that. Let me ask you, I, I, we're almost out of time, but I, one of the things that we haven't talked enough about here, and not just here, but generally, is whether the leapfrogging we saw with cell phones, which was instrumental in your phenomenal business success and which will make it possible for you at the appropriate time to do what you've done on a global scale, hitherto unimaginable in all of human history for anybody to have any of their own health data. We haven't, we've seen examples, but not the kind of dramatic penetration we need with energy and clean energy and enough and in short enough time to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. So do you believe that, I mean, your country has done more than anybody else to try to put up solar panels and some of your companies went broke because you overdid it, right? But beforehand, and you gotta work out the phase out of the coal, the phase into the sun and all that. Meanwhile, uh, Africa, which is growing like crazy because of the cell phone in no small measure, and has six of the fastest growing countries in the world, still has vast swaths of its land totally dark at night. Do you believe that it's possible for us to scale up with distributed solar power rather than centralized as quick as we did with a cell phone? And if so, and if that were your business, if you had to quit what you're doing today and start there, how would you do it? And how would you do it? Lady first, I know that. You know, I'm, I'm such a huge believer in technology, and I think especially right now, we're at an incredible time in terms of new technology and the ability to apply technology in a scalable way towards solving some of these problems. So I would look at it in the context of some of the renewable solutions that we already have, and in the context of empowering, connecting individuals 
with access to those solutions and in the context of creating markets around them. I think that there's real opportunity to actually create an ecosystem in which people can financially benefit from these solutions, and I think that's going to drive an adoption. I think in developing economies, there's a revenue stream associated with that, and the more we can turn even already some of the technologies that we have into markets, the more that we can fuel, I believe, local growth and individual engagement in, in beginning to adopt some of these solutions. And just related to that, Jack, you answer it, and then I'll ask you one final question. Yeah, I, I am a strong believer that technology can make the world much better, because people say China economy is getting slower. I'm happy about 7%, even 5%. Even 5% of the GDP of the number of China, of the second large economy, is big enough. But you, you don't expect China to keep on growing 11%. Because like a one, body, one human body, when you are 1.8 meters tall, you cannot keep on like a 10% growth every year. You have to grow the quality, your mind, the wisdom. So I think China needs new technology to solve these problems. And which today, the data, the, the, the clean technology, all these things that China is supposed to do, if we keep on the, tradition, the, the, the old ways, we'll go nowhere. But this is why I feel excited because people ask me, what is your dream now? Because I never thought I would be today. I can s sit here talking to president. I'm like a guy you know, on the street and like, failed three times for university, five times for, for high key schools. I applied for 10 times in Harvard school, all rejected. I never thought, because of the technology, because the internet gives me this opportunity. So I think when I retire, I don't want the Chinese people have a terrible water to drink, unsafe for food, and the money we make all spent in the hospital. That's disaster. So how we can use the technology to enable young people, the greater chance of this world, don't worry about it. We got 1.4 billion people who were born in 1980s. They are the people of the internet times. They are going to have new ways to solve the world problems. The things you are worried about today, they can solve it. And a human being have the, these kind of worries for centuries. And young people can always solve it. And today, when you have a right direction, clean energy, you know, the, the, the climate change, all these issues, they will be solved. And these are the great opportunities ahead of us. Anything else? I, I agree with that. I, I think the more the more we can the more we can enfranchise people, the more we can create ecosystems in which individuals are empowered, the more we give rights to individuals to be able to build businesses, to be able to to pursue the economic benefit of technologies, the more you see these markets change. Mm -hmm. Before they leave the stage. I want you to look at them. And I want you to think about the time we have had to spend here dealing with the refugee problems in Syria and Lebanon. Stand up, Elias. This is my friend Elias Boussab. He's the education minister in Lebanon. He's got to educate all these kids. And so he left a miracle that very much reflects the lives that Elizabeth and Jack have lived. He was uh, in a very responsible position at the American University of Dubai. They started bringing American scholars over there to live in an, an Arabic culture. He did all these wonderful things. Lebanon got in trouble. He went home to save his country. What is the difference? How much more could he and every smart Lebanese person do if they could focus on these things? And why can he not? Because the place is dominated by people who think their differences are more important than their common humanity and their common challenges. You cannot imagine... Jack Ma's proud of being Chinese. I like that. He never hit it. He's, he's happy about it. I'm proud to be a global citizen. Too. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine Elizabeth's proud to be 
a blonde-haired, blue-eyed American techno whiz from Northern California. Yes. But they don't, not a word either one of them has said has defined the meaning of their lives or the direction of their work with negative reference to someone else. My friend Dikembe Mutombo, stand up. No, you don't have to stand up. It'll hurt you too much. You're an old man. My seven foot two inch fall friend was just inducted into the National Basketball Association Hall of Fame. And he, uh, my family, my whole family loves him. And I have seen how much he has given back to his native country, Congo, which has been so troubled. I've known him a long time. We both went to Georgetown University. I did before he was born, I think. I've never heard him say a resentful thing about anybody. I have seen him give and give and give and try to give the people in his native land opportunities. Why am I telling you this? He's had a good life because he never defined his life with negative reference to anybody else. He never begrudged anybody else's success. And he thought he had an obligation to help other people. I'm telling you, this is the, we are back in a time of collective global insecurity where the main struggle is the oldest one in human history, just in modern techno realities. I mean, if you were trying to build the Middle East, you would think about our permanent sponsor here, the ambassador from Oman, who tried to, her government tried to help head off a calamitous war in the Middle East over the nuclear issue in Iran. We all pray to God that it'll work out all right. And the lead she made. You look around all these places, wherever people are putting aside their differences and working together, good things are happening. We cannot achieve economic or social equality without living in the factual realities of the world we face, looking at the obstacles, looking at the opportunities, making the best decisions. And those of us who even feel good about ourselves because we think we spend a lot of time giving, our whole goal should be to work ourselves out of a job. One of the things that the Bill and Tanny Austin are sitting there with Starkey, they started giving away hearing aids and then they decided, well, we better teach these young people how to speak. If they get the gift of hearing, they'll have to learn that. So they got into the education business. Sonny Varkey got into the education business and decided somebody ought to do something really dramatic to remind people that the only people that really matter are the teachers. So he gave the first Global Teacher of the Year award last year, and an international panel gave the prize to a teacher from Maine who promptly gave the entire million dollars to her school. The woman never made any money in her life. She gave all the money away immediately. The future is going to be forged by people who think of how to use the modern tools that we are given, as Elizabeth and Jack have, to create opportunity through empowerment. And it, it will not be a straight line. It's too, too many moving parts. And, but I, I just want you to think about that. The reason you feel good looking at them is that you identify with them even though they're different from you. And that's basically where we are all over again, and we can't slip back. We can't give up. That's why when we had the Prime Minister of Italy and George Soros talking about the future of Europe, and George said it was coming apart, and the Prime Minister said, no, it doesn't have to come apart if it's about something more than economics. I thought it doesn't have to come apart if you will it not to and you put yourself on the line for it. There are no guaranteed outcomes today, but you can guarantee that the trend is right. So go ahead, Dee, we're gonna say something, weren't you? 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I mean, as we're talking about the future and, and from my own experience and looking at all the faces here, I, I think a huge part of the answer to your question is also to raise our little girls with the stereotype that they can be the best in engineering and science and math. Because when they do in all of these industries, it changes everything. And we need to do that in this country, and we need to do that as parents in other countries. You know? Yeah, I was <clears throat> thinking about if uh, what you say. Um, I think about when you want, when you talk about uh, problems, you normally it's like a politician. When you talk about opp opportunities, that the business people. I was thinking about how we can using you know this all the problems that change the problem become the opportunity. And um, I I don't know. I just feel excited when people talk about problems. I think that's, think about, if you can solve one of them, that's the chance. And today, nobody in live in this century has so many opportunities and so many uh, tools they can use to change other people's life. And I think in, in the last century, which I call IT time, this century is called a DT time, data technology. IT is to empower yourself, make yourself strong. DT is to empower the others. When you empower the others, you empower your future and yourself. So when I listen to your talk, I agree. And I think uh, that's why we were born in this century. That's why we, uh, how we can use the internet to help more people. Let's give them a hand. Thank you.